Today is Monday of the second week of the new school term. During the last period of the afternoon, that restless one, you know, waiting for the bell. I'm just beginning to get acquainted with a lot of new young people and learning something new about a number I've known since you were here. This always is the most wonderful time of year to me and Monroe, when everything seems to be brighter and more perfect than at any other time, and cleaner. When we seem to be starting off all over again, with everybody somehow expecting the finest thing. forgotten the beautiful Indian summers, the calm, warm, fresh days of early autumn, just before the rain set in, just before the foliage changes, when the buses are always on schedule and attendance 100%. I can hear the footballs thumping. The squads have been working hard for a week. They miss Bill Biglow, who turned out your winning teams. Your favorite coach is in the signal corps now. change today if you could look out on our village. No new building to tell about down on our one block main street. Never much of a bustle this time of a Monday. A lot less traffic than you were used to. The summer folks have gone back to the city. I expect you can conjure up the black water of the lake and the little ducks never suspecting that winter is just around the corner. There are only touches of wartime a junior victory garden still flourishing. I can smell the leaves burning over in front of the Methodist parsonage. Roscoe Smith just led some of his livestock over the bridge by the mill. Our school population is greater than ever before. John Jenkins still guards the traffic. And the old tower on Monroe High overlooking half the township is an airplane spotter's post now. Well, Sergeant Dugan, I've been here 24 years since I was as young as you and Amy. I expect you were hoping I'd get to Amy. She's my fellow school teacher this year, music instructor. Last Friday, Amy and I met Mr. Smith, the postman. He was going to your farm, said it was urgent, and asked us to go with him. A package from overseas had just arrived for your mother. Much too important to wait, he said. So he was making a special trip. Naturally, Amy had to go along. And you know how I am. Curiosity will kill me yet. <laughs> Your brother Bobby, who was cutting the lawn, came racing to meet us down by the drive, terribly excited. He said he knew it was your medal because, of course, the news of your bravery, Tom, had been in the papers for a week. To be truthful, we were all just as excited as Bobby. We bustled up that steep lawn of yours all out of breath in a pretty fluster, you can imagine. Your father came into the house, and it was almost like a ceremony before they got the parcel open, with all those strings and wrappings. You guessed it, Tom. It was your silver star. Everyone tried pretty hard not to be too emotional about it but had to try pretty hard. And you never saw anyone look as proud and as radiant as Amy. Your father took the medal to the door and stood examining it without saying a word. Your mother keeps the clippings about you from the Monroe Gazette and a quite long one from the New York Times on the walnut table by the front parlor window. That's pretty much your table now. 
dedicated to the military records and private letters of Sergeant Thomas Dugan. That's where the roses were you telegraphed your mother on her birthday. What a fine, mellow room for memories. A hundred years of life with the Dugans of Orange County on those walls. There's a mystery story about the roses. Bobby has been replenishing them in secret with flowers he gets by trading dahlias from the farm to Mr. Oldfield, the florist. He's not quite sure your mother hasn't caught on. The roses, you see, have apparently stayed fresh for a month now. We went up to your room, just as it was when you left it. A little cleaner, maybe. Your mother dusts it every day. Your trophies and your gun. I'd forgotten how you were always winning things. And the Lord's Prayer by the window. And those basketball pictures. Every boy in them except one, now in service. your old flipper start up. It always gives your mother a turn, she says. She can't help but expect you to drive in. Your cranky old car is serving manfully. Bobby has hooked it up to run the milk separator. thinking most about you these days, Tom Dugan, but I shan't. Their beauty sort of choked me up. So, I went and peered from your west window. A wonderful autumn view, gold and green to the woodlot. Your mother never looks out that way, Tom, because she always remembers you and Bobby cutting across, swinging your books, and Sambo the cocker racing to meet you. Pepper, the dignified Springer, helping with the cows, working hard. Everybody's working hard because, of course, there's no help. And 44 cows make quite a herd. <laughs> Joe Jackson and your tenant joined up, and the empty tenant house looks pretty forlorn. It's hard to see how your father gets everything done but he never seems to fall behind. He put the money he used to pay Joe Jackson into a milking machine, and of course that helps quite a lot. And that strapping Bobby helps more than quite a lot. I expect your brother Bobby's grown a foot since you saw him. He says he's in training to follow you as the best fullback and broad jumper Monroe ever had. Friday always was a special night to the young people of Monroe, you'll remember. Still is. In Krasnoff's window with your picture are photos of more than 140 of your comrades. The sun never sets on our heroes. What with so many away at war and working in the munitions plants upstate, the soda shops usually stay open alternate evenings only. But Friday, all of them get business from the young people. All three of them. Pfeiffer's was jammed before the school dance. It was all Jerry Meek could do to keep abreast of the trade. Just like old times, except for the many missing bows like you and Lieutenant Jack Turner and Ensign Horace Brown and all the others. 
Jerry Meek said the way you used to drive your flipper around corners on two wheels proved you'd be a terrific soldier. Yes, he's got your dispatches posted, too. Right at the height of his oratory, Jerry discovered your mother and just about demanded that she take a bow. How proud she is of you. A beautiful woman, to my way of thinking. Up at the First Presbyterian Church, Mrs. Sylvester was conducting choir practice. Jack Sylvester, one of the leading military authorities of the county, was pumping the organ and reading a book on his specialty. Amy was at the console, as usual. Your girl is our leading musician, without a doubt. This was a lovely night for choir practice. Just the faintest nip of autumn. The church door open and the light lying golden on the turnpike. A still village, full of peace. your brother-in-law's auto sales room, county headquarters for the Red Cross now. Your sister, Mary Enright, was serving coffee to the ladies of the chapter. Since Mary's husband took his war plant job, he and Mary have spent most of their time keeping this place spick and span and comfortable. Your nieces, Sue and Mary Jr., came dancing across the floor. Seems strange to see your brother-in-law in work clothes most of the time. He's lost weight, but he looks fine. Well, Friday was my night for gadding. Naturally, I had to help chaperone the senior freshman dance. I never missed any of yours, did I? Claire Bell Summers, County Agent Summers' little girl, was dancing her first dance with Enoch Jenkins' boy. I'm sure I don't know how they grow up so fast. Steve Mosher, whose eyes keep him out of the army, was waltzing with Margaret Brown. Peg's got her hair up now. play swing, too. Guess who was back from Marine Boot Camp? Your old friend, Cliff Jones. And what eyes Emily Stone was making at him. Seems yesterday I gave her a doll. Oh, well. Tempest Puget. I left while Amy was playing Liebestraum. I wanted to hear it drifting down over the moonlit village. I wished Amy's playing could reach you, wherever you are. And somehow, being a funny old school teacher, and sort of bewitched, I thought it might. Now, if you had been up and around in the town of Monroe at seven Saturday morning, you'd have seen Bill Mack patrolling. Quietest beat on earth, I expect. Albert's cat was stealing cream on the Sutherland's front porch as Dr. Sutherland set out on his rounds. A terribly busy man since his son joined the army. Your father and mother and Bobby drove up to Tim Burns' blacksmith shop to have Mort shod. Mort's got to be a highly prized character with gasoline rationing as it is. had those clippings about you in a place of honor, too. Tim fought in the Boer War, and he gets pretty red-faced, wishing he could get at those Japs. Monroe had big doings on this day. 
a parade with the Legion out in force. Up Main Street and out to the park they marched. Really a turnout. You would have been proud. The volunteer firemen, not many young members now. And the civilian defense groups. The dedication of the new Roll of Honor board was the occasion, filled with a bond selling rally and a Red Cross drive. I do believe there wasn't a soul left on Main Street. My friend, we do pay tribute to you heroes in Monroe. Bill Rogers told me afterward that he sold $6,000 worth of bonds. Bill Biglow, your football coach, was back, resplendent in his captain's bars. The boys gave him a mighty welcome. And there was Ann Perkins, whose husband is somewhere over the Pacific, and her little boy. And Mrs. Daly, who lost her boy in the Argonne so long ago. And Major Sam Bull, who served under Teddy Roosevelt in the Rough Riders. I wish you might see the honor roll. You're in fine company there. I realize that this all may sound trivial, but from the standpoint of yours sincerely, this is the state of the nation. Yes, I'm sure that you can read between the lines and know that this is America. <laughs>